Hi witchlings, welcome back to my channel. Today, I am revisiting the basics of meditation and astral projection. I don't really want to do this. I say that about so many videos that I make. <laughs> I don't want to do this. He can't keep getting away with it. I just, this is like, I think the oldest video that I still have left that I haven't revisited apart from basics of divination. And basics of divination, I feel like is relatively tame. It's not like crazy. Let's make sure you guys cannot see how many tabs I have open. I am not someone who really meditates anymore. And I know I'm gonna get pissed if I say it all in this video that it's like necessary and you have to do it. I think I made this video private already just cause I have no idea what's in it. <laughs> if you like the new setup, say thank you, Olivia. The Witch of Wonderlust very much helped with this. And I really like how it looks now. Ah, oh, geez, 15 minutes. History, skepticism, and my experience unlisted. Good. Research shows the spells you can help. I love paying myself. So a few notes before I go into this. I do not astral project anymore. I do not meditate anymore. I know meditation is good for you. We did an entire podcast episode talking about it. But I also think that meditation, at least in the Western world, is heavily misappropriated um, and misunderstood. And to learn about it, you should learn from someone, I don't know, someone who has a lot of experience in a lot of different areas of meditation, not just the kind of Western understanding of meditation. I don't astral project anymore. I pray. And my prayer, in to an extent, is kind of like trance work. It's very much something that I connect with my guides and my deities through. And apart from that, I think I, I remain in the very practical areas of spirituality and witchcraft, um, which isn't necessarily bad. I just found that it wasn't practical for me to be doing meditation as much as people said I should be doing it. And my practice is not one that really requires astral projection. Folk magic includes like trance work and channeling, which you do need to have kind of a basis of meditation or a basis of like mindfulness is usually what I say. So I practice mindfulness more than meditation in these days. Help you remember ads to customize and save. Okay. I love insurance. This is the weirdest ad. It literally just says take shrooms. All right. Hi, Witchlings. It's Chaotic Witch Haunt. Welcome back to my channel. Today is... Firstly, the audio. I just want to thank, once again, Olivia, aka The Witch Wonderlust, for this. This is why we have this mic. This is the one that uh, she uses, and I love it. Another highly requested video. Um, I'm going to be talking about both meditation and astral projection. These are really... <laughs> Does anyone else see the dead plant in the back? Like, <laughs> right here. There's just a fucking dead plant. <laughs> I love that. Just a dead Calathea in the back. And then I have my saint. This is my saint altar over here. I love these earrings. They broke. Important topics when it comes to witchcraft. Um, I don't think it's that important. Especially meditation. I consider it one of the pillars of witchcraft. Although med so once again, this is just a difference of opinion between past me and present me. Because I'm a folk practitioner, I do not consider meditation to be a basic of witchcraft anymore or a pillar of witchcraft. I do... I just don't. I think that meditation is a... This is my opinion. I feel like meditation is both what we expect it to be and what we don't expect it to be. I don't know if this makes any sense. I did explore my perspective on meditation now a little bit more in this uh, podcast episode we did with Mixed Can Even, and I really liked the conversation we had there. I typically refer to what I do as trance work, channeling, or mindfulness. I don't really refer to it as meditation anymore, uh, just because I feel like personally it doesn't make sense for my practice. Meditation did not originate in the Western world. So Bitch. 
I'm going yes. to be talking about the origins of meditation, history of astral projection, and all this other stuff. Both of these topics that I'm covering in this video should not be the only thing you read on both of these topics. You shouldn't watch this video and then that's it. You've known all you need to know. You always should be looking for more information, always cross-referencing, always double-checking. I love this bitch. This is my favorite one because I didn't go into it saying this is my, I went into it saying this is my opinion and you shouldn't, this shouldn't be the only thing you watch. I love that. I think that's really important even now with my videos. I don't think my content should be the only place you search for information. I think that you should take what you feel resonates from my content and cross-reference it. Um, and that goes for this video too, especially because these are things that are very much a personal practice, um, as well as a historical practice. So <laughs> That's the worst place to intro. Watch, watch. Personal practice, um, as well as a historical practice. So, so, I cut myself off. This is when I was still editing my videos. Oh, wait, May. To get us started off, I'm gonna grab my cum pooper and we're gonna be talking a little bit about what meditation is. Now, I'm sure that you've heard of meditation, especially if you're a modern witch, a lot of people tell you you need to meditate. It's an important pillar for your craft. It is, but you should also know where meditation came from. So I disagree, but well, this is just me now. So some archaeologists date meditation back to as early as 5000 BCE, and it has religious ties in ancient Egypt, China, as well as- Coming in with the Google, the Google, the google -L search. Love that for me. Judaism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, and of course, Buddhism. So I usually recommend people should read about meditation when it comes to Buddhism. Um, it's closely attached to that but the oldest documented text of meditation is from India, from the Hindu traditions of meditism from around 1500 BC. The Vedas created texts describing meditative practices. It's important to note that these previously have been passed down orally through storytelling practices for centuries. I usually recommend learning about what meditation is in Hinduism and Buddhism. How about this? How about this? Yes? Okay, and so here's the thing is, I'm agreeing with everything that I am saying. I do think that meditation is very like misappropriated and misunderstood and oftentimes it's taught by people who have never really understood kind of or didn't learn from teachers who understand where it originated which is in Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikh, like all the things I mentioned, all the religions I mentioned. I think that meditation has spread really far um, into the Western world, but I also think that in that spread, it has changed and been capitalized on. Um, and once again, if you want more kind of talk about this, it's in that one podcast episode. I'll link it down below. It's with Mix Can't Even. We talked a lot about misappropriation and the capitalization of meditation, but also how meditation is not just one thing. And I think that that speaks to it being found in so many different religions and so many different spiritual schools of thought, there's no one way to approach it, but you should still look at where it originated from when learning how to meditate. Because I think that I always feel like we kind of get more into like new agey mindfulness type stuff when we separate it really far from its origins. And if that's your vibe, then that's your vibe. But for me, that never really made any sense. What does make sense in my practice is praying, trance work, channeling. Those are the ones that it closely has ties to. And it is fantastic, like absolutely fantastic. If you look and research meditation in multiple different sources. Um, it's also found in- Yes, I do think you should research meditation in multiple different sources. Do not just read a book, one book, and say, I know everything. If you really are really interested in learning, because I think meditation has become like, at least in witchcraft, it is 
something that I think every witch should know how to kind of work with their energy and quiet their mind and meditation is one of the ways of accomplishing that another way of accomplishing that I just fuck around and find out <laughs> and it dates back at least 1,400 years. Um, it's an ancient Islamic tradition. And it's different through all these practices, which is interesting. And there is also believed to be descriptions of meditative practice in the Torah, the Jewish esoteric method, method and school of thought of Kabbalah, and some form of meditation. I think I pronounced Kabbalah wrong. Kabbalah, Kabbalah. I think it's Ka Kabbalah with a K, I think. Most religions have some form of meditation. We could argue that Christianity has a form of meditation, even if they don't call it meditation. Um, New Age spiritual. <laughs> so I've hit the point in my practice, and so this is the only uh, thing that I have, the only, you know, like hardcore criticism I have of this video so far is that I think words and terms matter. And I say that because words have power. Um, and words have meanings that are ascribed to them historically and in present day. So I think that Christians are not going to call what they do meditation. It's praying or it's communing with speed, like with God. And I think that I understand where younger me is coming from and saying, even if they don't call it meditation, that's what it is. But not every Christian is going to be comfortable with that and not every witch or practitioner is going to be comfortable with ascribing the same term to something when it's like similar, but it's not the same. And I think that's an important thing to note is that yes, prayer, trance work, channeling can be similar to meditation, but I personally don't use the term meditation and I'm very that's like an active choice for me. That's not something I do in passing. That's an active decision that I make. So words have power. It's like saying like, well, folk magic is basically witchcraft. It's not. And a lot of, I talked about this a lot recently on my Instagram is that a lot of folk practitioners are not comfortable with being called witches because historically in places where folk magic has prospered, witchcraft was seen as the bad thing. Witches were evil. And we can delve into like that witchcraft as a term of the other and witchcraft as a term uh, that has, you know, historically been demonized and historically associated with anti-Semitism. But a lot of folk practitioners, even to this day, don't say that they're witches because what they don't consider what they do witchcraft. And historically speaking, they wouldn't have consider what they do witchcraft. So even if we in the modern day understand folk magic as being very similar to or being in our minds witchcraft, it is not. And I think it's similar to like what I'm kind of talking about here is meditation can be similar to other practices in different spiritual traditions and religions and not be meditation. And that's just me. I'm very mindful of the words I use because words have power and because it, I, I may say something that's actually historically inaccurate in the, in the case of like folk magic and witchcraft. Like I call myself a folk witch, but when I talk about folk magic, I say I'm an Italian American folk practitioner and that what I do is informed by folk magic. But I don't typically, I used to, but I don't typically ascribe my folk magic to being witchcraft. I think that I blend the two together. And so I work with folk magic, I work with witchcraft. I know folk practitioners who call themselves witches and folk witches like me with that kind of blending. But at the same time, historically speaking, and they're like, even now, there are a lot of folk practitioners who wouldn't like that. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people in like, like me in certain spiritual practices or traditions that they wouldn't be comfortable with calling what they do meditation, even if it's very similar. And that's okay. And I think that, you know, words have power and the words that you use are up to you. Anyways. Body has forms of meditation and puts an emphasis on it. Um, and meditation became of interest to the West in the 1700s. Um, some Eastern philosophies. When I'm saying the West, I mean Europe. Turtle Island, specifically America, Canada, 
that's to me in my mind it's not all of that but when i am talking about the west i am talking a lot about the west as a colonial understand like i don't even know I, I hope that's just my that's it the texts um containing references to meditation techniques were translated into different european languages included the upanishads the bhagavad gita and the buddhist sutras so i have a copy of the bhagavad gita that i Fun story about that copy, people came to me and they were like, I was at college and they were like, we want to like give you this as a gift. And I'm like, oh, a free book? Cool, I'll take a free book. And they were like, <laughs> they were like, yeah, but for this gift, we do ask for a donation. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, they did an entire spiel about how they didn't want to call it like, they're not selling it. It was like an off, like it was a different word that was like a gift and offering. But in order to keep it, you did need to pay them fifteen dollars. I paid them fifteen dollars. Like to study, I like to go through it. And then the 18th century meditation was only a topic of discussion and interest by philosophers and intellectuals. And it was only it wasn't only until the 20th century that meditation became more prominent, especially in the United States. So it is relatively new here. It is relatively a new phenomenon. That doesn't mean that Western people who say that they're very skilled in it aren't skilled in it. It just means that I usually recommend going to the people who have the closest ties with it, who brought it. This isn't a bad video so far, all I'm gonna say. ...here, reading those texts. I was brought over by a prominent yogi, Swami Vivekananda, when they delivered a presentation at the- I was trying really hard to get that right. <laughs> I paused it and everything. I said, I do, I cannot mispronounce this. I, re I respect that. ...prominent of real religions in Chicago. This is the important part. With its introduction in the West, meditation began to become more removed from the religious connections and teachings of its roots and taught in more westernized ways. Mm. By the 1960s and 1970s, meditation was being researched via scientific studies, further removing its spiritual context and encouraging the practice to be used by anyone, not those just seeking spiritual fulfillment. Benson did some of the first studies and he wrote a best-selling book called The Relaxation Response. And he is the Mind Body Medical Institute. In the late 1970s, John Kabat Zinn discovered meditation through his studies at MIT. So, transcendental meditation was growing in popularity around 1970s, 1979. A lot of celebrities turning to it for fame, although during this time, meditation techniques were connected predominantly with hippie culture and were not very mainstream. It wasn't until. I'm so bored in this video. This video bores me is when the Western research start. It's been around for a really long time. <laughs> I'm just reading off something. We're gonna skip ahead. Difficulties meditating. They can't do it, etc. There's the quote unquote traditional way for meditation or kind of what we think of when we see meditation. Um, you like sit cross-legged and kind of clear your head or sit with your head and just sit with your thoughts. I can't do that. <laughs> And let's be honest, considering its background, it takes a lot of discipline to do that. It takes a lot of focus. It takes a lot of training to be able to meditate in that way and just fully go into it, go into a meditative state. That's an important thing to remember is that it's not like an easy thing to do. I, I'm, I think this is the first video where I watched this and I'm like, I actually had an okay opinion. <laughs> I actually kind of like this video, at least the meditation part. What I'm saying in this video of this is not an easy thing. Yeah, people train years to like get to the point where they can sit in it for an hour in silence. And that's wild that I think we put so much pressure on doing it. I. I don't, know, I don't know. I'm not, I don't hate this video. I thought I was going to hate this video. We haven't gotten to the astral projection section, so I may hate it then. I usually opt for mindfulness techniques rather than meditation or active. <laughs> I still do that. I say, I'm going to do mindfulness. <laughs> I also love active meditation, which is literally just kind of 
doing something and meditating or being mindful of what you're doing and mindful of your breathing. And the reason I say mindfulness, once again, is because I feel like it encapsulates what I practice more than the term meditation does. There are also a lot, a lot of meditation, like guided meditations online. I do still love guided meditations, but not for meditating. I will put, <laughs> I put them on to go to bed. <laughs> When I have trouble sleeping, I'm like, let me just put on a guided meditation because it's like, for me, it helps my brain be quiet. And I love that. About lunar breathing. He's talking about... What am I talking about? Square oh, I'm reading from Psychic Witch, which I do still think is a good book for energy work and understanding some basics of meditation and mindfulness. Once again, I think that learning from multiple books is a great way of doing it. I'm gonna scoot. Where's the astral projection section? We do know that astral projection counts as a shared personal gnosis, a shared kind of situation that many people have had over many centuries. Um, people, shamans used to do astral projection or have out-of-body experiences. This is like a very well-researched video. Something that many, many people have experienced and can back up and testify that they experienced it but there still isn't a way for science to measure whether your consciousness is actually leaving your body and going to a different plane or not. And that's the thing, the science can't prove it. There's not a lot of studies on it or just occult topics in general. So when you look it up, you will see a lot of topics that are like, is it just a mind trip? Are you really just lucid dreaming? Let's be clear, even if astral projection is not an out of, out of body experience, it's lucid dreaming or a mind trip, you are still, it is still important. And when I say that is a lot of people are like, well, I talk to my deities or I talk to my spirits in the astral. What if I'm lucid dreaming? Does that mean it's not real? No. Deities and spirits are known to show up in people's dreams too. It doesn't make it any less real. It's still a valid experience that you are having. This is the most practical video I made in my 2020, my 2021 YouTube era. That is, ins this is insane. It's very grounded, which I was not expecting. And I think I made some assumptions about, I make assumptions about my old content based on some of the older videos I've done that I've seen, like the deity work one was kind of unhinged. Um, <laughs> so I was expecting this one to be unhinged as well, and it's not. So I'm actually, And here's the thing is like, one, yes, it is a shared personal gnosis. Two, yeah, it doesn't matter if astral projection isn't what we understand it to be. You are still having an experience that is important to you and that means something to you. It's like when I talk about, um, I think I did a So You Want to Work With Deities video and I talked about people having a discussion on whether deities can send signs. And I said, I don't think it really matters because even if the deity or the divine being is not directly sending that sign, your subconscious is still paying attention to that order of events and leading you to the divine being. So it's okay if it's your subconscious telling you you wanna work with that God and not a divine being sending a sign because it's still kind of a sign. It's still kind of your subconscious and something leading you there and that can be a sign in itself. And so when we talk about astral projection, you're still having an experience that's important to you and that is profound to you and that has meaning. It's like when I am doing channeled messages from my ancestors or from my guides, even if it is my subconscious telling me what to do, I am still receiving information that affects me and is profound. This is not a bad video. I'm pleasantly surprised with this. It still puts you in a position where you're a little disconnected from the physical plane and your physical body so you can commune with spirits and deities. Yeah, I mean, I think, okay, I think that for me, in my experience, I need a lot more pomp and circumstance to get ready to, like, receive messages or commune with a divine being. Like I like doing a conjuration. I like doing a whole ritual. And nowadays I like to sit in silence and kind of just open up 
let go of expectations for what I feel like information I'm going to get and just whatever comes in, write it down. Um, almost like automatic writing, but a little bit more intentional. And even then I'll probably, I still rely on tarot and oracle cards a little bit more, but yeah, man, this is not a bad video. Why do people astro project? A lot of reasons, but um, some people astro project to talk with deities. People have astro projected for centuries to receive messages from higher beings, higher self, the universe, whatever you want to call it. It's important for you to kind of understand what it is really before you do it. See, that don't make no sense. <laughs> I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. There's no really way to fully understand what your experience is going to be with something as personal and like, like there's no manual really for astral projection. Like there are things that you can do to help you get there, but everyone's gonna have a different experience. So there's no way for you to fully understand what it is. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> I started this video with, we don't know what astral projection is. It's like, you should actually know what it is before you do it. How, Frankie? Let me know how, because I still don't know what it is. And I <laughs> made this video. <laughs> New Approach to Out-of-Body Experiences by Robert Bruce. I have not read it. Okay, I'm glad I said I have not read it because I still haven't read it. And I recommended it, which means uh, don't read that. If you wanna read it, you can, but I don't know anything about the book. I don't know why I recommended it. I think I was looking through the sources in the, ba in the back of a book I liked. I have a tendency now to read a book before I recommend it. I cannot tell you if it's good or not. The astral and like get an attachment with a negative spirit who finds it. Here's the unhinged. I think I'm regurgitating something I saw on TikTok. That is, I think, what this is because I don't know. I'm not doubting that this is a thing that could happen, but this is definitely something I'm regurgitating. And that hooks on to you, and that's easy. That's, you do an unbinding, you banish them. So I think my opinion now is that you could form a negative, like an, a negative spirit could take a liking to you in a lot of different situations. So just be good with your boundaries, ward your house. And some people don't even believe in like, negative entities like that i do i'm superstitious my beliefs are we got a bad vibes that we got a whole thing called worms in italian folk magic vermi it's like worms spiritual worms in your body it's terrifying that's like the, <laughs> that's an attachment the idea of negative attachments is very present in Italian folk magic, but the way you get them is not necessarily going to be how I'm describing it here. It's not because someone has to project it without protection. It's someone like someone put a really nasty curse on you or a evil eye multiple times. And those worms or like, it's like stuck to you almost. That's why they're called worms because it's like, energy that's, or negativity that's really difficult, like you need to do a more intense removal or healing for it, but it's not like actual worms. I think they're called worms because of the way that they stick to you, but I'm not sure about that. That's the only kind of thing that I've heard. Um, someone astral projected in their sleep when they were a kid and they have the entity years later and don't know how. Hope that the person's doing okay. I get rid of it. Um, and that was a non-witch or a beginner witch who had had it for decades. And that- Once again, hope that person's doing okay. Is something that I have seen happen a couple times. But if you're going in like you're wearing a protective charm, you have protection crystals in your hand, your house is- I honestly, so here's the thing is, I don't ask to project anymore. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it. If you're doing something that works for you, great. Do I think that it, would be better to do any sort of like spiritual channeling in a space that is protected? Yes. Because I feel like no matter your opinion on astral projection or trance work or channeling, being in a safe place will ensure good experience. Being protected will just mark all your bases. And that's kind of how I would approach it. I don't necessarily think that you have to protect. Like if you don't protect not something terrible isn't necessarily going to happen, but I think 
doing something that could put you in a vulnerable position physically and spiritually, having a safe space physically and spiritually is really beneficial for that. It's protected. There's a less chance for you to like that to happen in my experience. I do not astral project very often. I <laughs> in my experience, followed by I do not do this often. <laughs> I love me from two years ago because I there were just certain things that I really don't think I knew much about or knew how to do and I was like I can still make a video on this and now I'm like I'm probably educated enough to make this video but I don't want to make it because I don't want to position myself as an authority figure or a teacher in areas that I'm not ready to be one in wild that's called growth baby I can, because I'm a medium, I can easily just receive. Do I still identify as a medium? No. Kind of. Yeah. So here's the thing is I think a lot of people who talk about mediums online and like publicly have gone through a certain level of like training and have been taught by other mediums. And I haven't experienced that. I did not seek out a teacher. I did not seek out training. So because of that, I kind of just stopped talking about it. I still have spiritual experiences. I still have something that I consider like a sixth sense when it comes to sensing when spirits are around or being very intuitive when it comes to energy in a spiritual sense, not with people, but with like other things. But because I never went down that path to like, becoming a professional medium or getting training. I focused on folk magic. I don't necessarily feel like it's appropriate for me to position myself in online and public spaces as, oh, I'm a medium because then people, I could, <clears throat> I'm not a part of the medium community. I didn't have a teacher, I'm not trained and I don't wanna give other mediums a bad rep as well as I don't wanna position myself as someone who knows something about mediumship, because I fucking don't. <laughs> Would I someday seek out training? Maybe if I find the right teacher. I basically got to a point where I was like, I don't really want to deal with this. And part of the reason why I veil is because I just don't want to deal with ghosts most of the time. I got a life, babe. I don't have time for that shit. I don't have time for a random spirit showing up to me and being like, can you help? And I'm like, uh-uh, no, go away. Overall, I think I strengthened my boundaries a lot with the spirits I work with and with, you know, the energy around me. And that strengthening of boundaries has made it so it's easier for me to receive messages when I want to receive them and not any other time. And for me, that's really all I needed. I didn't want to go down the path of becoming a professional medium. I'm just okay with it informing my experience, you know, and having that kind of being able to sense when something's around or being able to feel things. And that's kind of all I've ever really described it as. My mom says I was like that even as a baby. So that's kind of cool. But I, that's, yeah, anyways. Leave messages. Um from people, I prefer using tarot cards. I don't like going to the astral that often because it's just... <laughs> All I'm thinking about is that I don't like to go to the astral that often. Me and I, I don't like to go to the grocery store that often. I hate the grocery store. Fluorescent lights, people, noises, and they're always playing music in the back. Like, get me overstimulated in five minutes or less, grocery store, especially King Supers. Whole Foods is a little better, feels tame difficult for me to get there. It's difficult for me to do it. I usually fall asleep and then I don't go. I need to be in a meditative state. It's like my meditation safe space, my astral projection safe space. Okay, I don't know what I'm talking about at this point. I'm probably, oh, this is actually really sweet. It looks like there was one a Vedic shaman and an Indian Hindu thanking me for acknowledging like origins of meditation, which I feel like I shouldn't get a thank you for that. That's like basics. In my opinion, that's like bare minimum is acknowledge the origin of where something came from. If you're not going to recognize that, why are you doing it?
That's just me. Um, I feel like this was a pretty chill video, except for the a few tiny sections. I was expecting it to be absolutely unhinged, but I think because there's so much space for personal gnosis and experience to change in the areas of meditation and astral projection. The approach I took in this video, which was like talking history, talking very practically, and then talking a bit about my experience was very good, very beneficial. And I do think that like, this is a video that could help people if they're looking into meditation astral projection but i don't know enough i think to position myself as like a teacher which is why i took i unlisted this video because i think there are better people who talk about this than me because <laughs> i'm like i said talked about astral projection for two minutes and then i'm like i don't do it that often why'd you make a video frankie probably because people asked and i didn't know how to say no back then <laughs> now i do so if you ask me for another video on this, I'm gonna tell you no, go find someone else. <laughs> I don't know who, just find someone else. So I was pleasantly surprised, genuinely pleasantly surprised by the, how this video was like not weirdly unhinged. I like it. So that makes me happy. I was incredibly tired. I do have, it looks like I have some like spirit communication stuff. There are some spirit communication books that I really like. And if that's something you're interested in when you're looking at a meditation astral projection, I will put those down below, including J. Allen Cross's like paranormal guide, the book of seances. And there's a book by Sterling Moon, hold on, talking to spirits. And she is a medium, like trained medium. So that I would recommend. I haven't read Sterling's book yet, but I do work with her and she is just the sweetest fucking lady ever. Sweetest lady. Talking to spirits, modern medium is practical advice for spiritual communication. I love Sterling. So I'll include that in this video along with Psychic Witch um, and the other kind of spirit or seance books that I think are really great. There's a lot more on the market now than there was when I originally made this video. Because as witchcraft gets more popular, more people start writing books about ghosty boys, and I love that for us. All right, pleasantly surprised by this video, didn't hate it. You get to hear some of my updated opinions about astral projection, communing with divine beings, etc. Because the last time I talked about it was literally two years ago. I don't think I've mentioned it since. And that's kind of my updated information. If I sound a little baritone today is because I had the flu last week, two weeks ago, and I'm still getting over the congestion. But I did really end up lucking it. Before we finish and I do my outro, I did want to note that my Patreon is now receiving Patreon-only vlogs every month. It is for the bol Boletus Edulis tier and up. That's $6 a month for extra content from me. Some things that the upper tiers have, Pluritus Populinus has our book club, Hydrocybe Konica has a weekly tarot reading with four cards as well as unfiltered book reviews from me. And Marcilla Medica receives two custom made spells a month that are chosen by patrons. I also have some mentorship uh, slots available at my top tier. If you're interested in that, you can message me on Patreon or subscribe at one of the lower tiers and then talk to me about the upper ones or just go ahead and subscribe to the top tier and we will begin work. I'll begin working with you. Thank you so much for watching. I enjoyed this video. I didn't hate it. You guys get to hear a little bit about my opinions and how they've changed in the past two years. Remember to drink water and have an amazing rest of your day. Siate Benedetti. Motherfucker, that shit hurted.